Uh, hello, uh, I'm Tiago. I'm a Linux developer and consultant and trainer. When I'm bored, I write Python code to, you know, draw interactive vector graphics on top of dumb text terminals. Because why not? Uh, this is not a tech demo. This is a talk about bringing people together. And I brought a few newcomers with me. Uh, I brought Joanna, Luis, Susanna, and Tomas. They work for the Lisbon Consulting Group, a fancy name client I work for. I've been pushing them to work and to use Python more and more and to come to events like these. And they're here with the support of their business unit manager. Pedro, are you there? Uh, after this, I'll either get fired or get a raise. I don't know. Uh, but essentially, I'd want you to join me in welcoming all newcomers to these conferences. So a quick round of applause for all newcomers, please. Go, oh, wait, I don't have time. Now, Python conferences are amazing experiences where we learn about new tools and techniques. We get to discuss them with the people that use them and create them and we kind of share frustrations and hopefully we figure out ways forward and ways past them and we see how others solve problems similar to ours. And while we're at it, we might even make a friend or two. Now this is a very serious business. EuroPython is one such yearly gathering, bringing together people from all around the world, mostly around Europe. And as of now, the organizers are running uh, a call for venue uh, in order to figure out where to hold the next edition of EuroPython. Um, so in order to inspire and to motivate all of us to contribute with good ideas, I figured we could kind of review where we've been before EuroPython. So we've been uh, back in 2009 in Birmingham in UK, and then for three years in a row in Firenze, Italia, and you must move your hands to say this, something like that, I don't know. And then in 2014, we've been uh, to Berlin in Germany, and in 15 and 16, my first EuroPython, why didn't I go before? Uh, Bilbao is playing amazing. And in 17, we went back to Italy in Rimini. Uh, in 18, we went to Scotland in Edinburgh. And in 19, we were all happily together in Basel, Switzerland. Now, in 2020 and 2021, we were in standard pandemic mode, so we were kind of remote, and luckily and happily, uh, we were all face-to-face -face together again this year, earlier uh, in July in Dublin, Ireland. Now, where should we go next? So this is where we've been. Uh, I say we could try somewhere central, why not? Uh, Austria. Uh, too expensive error. We've got to trace back. No way, okay? So let's go further south. Maybe southern Europe is cheaper. I don't know. Maybe maybe this tiny country. I'm ignorant of geography. Okay, but let's try this one. Oh, the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia named too long error. No way. Where would our tweets go, right? Um, so we might we might try central, but a bit further north. Why not the Czech Republic? Nice, but not Portugal warning. You can see I'm biased, right? Uh, well, what about Portugal? Why not? Uh, yeah, great food and great surf warning. Nobody will be at the conference, OK? Uh, so we could play around with this all day. And as long as we're together and we're safe, uh, it should be good. Uh, and I was, as I was kind of playing with this, I realized that from the bottom of my heart, I really knew where I wanted the next EuroPython edition to be. Uh, and that's Ukraine. For that would mean that this stupid war is over, that the people from Ukraine are free to rebuild, to go on with their lives, and to follow on their dreams, certainly with the support of their European friends. Now, back in July, I met three incredibly amazing young Ukrainian women they were there, they flew back to Ukraine. They are here today, I don't know if they are here, but they're in the Django Girls Workshop. And in my fantasy, they're like coding, committing, pushing, and bombs are falling. And they commit, they push, and bombs are falling. They are an inspiration, and I made this for them. I want EuroPython in Ukraine sooner rather than later. Thank you. Woo! Hi, who here listens to podcasts? Okay, nice. Who here listens to technical podcasts? Okay, half, good. So 
I want today to convince you to listen to more technical podcasts because it, they will improve you as a developer and they will also improve, improve your lives as you know, general human beings. Um, so we can go like bottom from the stack up. So the most technical thing, for example, would be Django chat, where they talk about people, you know, with pe where people talk about Django itself, for example, and there's like a, any language you can think of, people will discuss it. And for me, it's super useful because if I say, I care about Rust suddenly, or I care about new language, and I don't need to do tutorials, I just listen to podcasts about that language, I pick up terminology, and I also pick up problems they talk about, right? You know, if you listen to Reg, they worry about, I don't know, testability. And they talk about tests so much, I'm like, okay, maybe I need to take, uh, you know, be careful about that. So that's one way to think about this. The other is you can just go like level up, for example, that would be ship it, and they talk about DevOps, and they talk about all the different ways that DevOps is broken, and what could be done better, and what came before, and so on. So that's one level of abstraction up. Um, Changelog, another excellent podcast. You know, people talk about new packages. So if you're thinking about, you know, should I use Docker or Terraform, just go through the archive, find somebody that actually wrote Terraform, and has like a two hour conversation with the uh, author of the podcast, and you know, okay, that's, that's what it was trying to solve. Which, because usually that's not written in the readme itself. Um, and then we have podcasts which are more general. So I'm putting Lex Friedman's podcast in because he has a recent, he recently interviewed John Carmack. It's five and a half hours interview. It's massive. It's the best thing I heard in the last month. Amazing. Who heard it? Is it amazing? Yes. Go listen to it. It's really good. Um, and then you have more soft skills, right? Going up the stack. Soft skills engineering is two IT guys, like engineering managers, discussing silly ideas how to fix problems, right? So, you know, you're fighting with your coworkers around the pull request, so they go, hmm, what would happen if I would, you know, do a prank on them or something? And they have really silly ideas, but then they kind of go, you go, huh, okay. That's not productive, but what would be productive? And they have some productive ideas. And so it's fun, it's lighthearted, but it gives you ideas like, huh, that's what my manager maybe is thinking. Like how that's from the other perspective, gives you empathy for the other person. So that's one, they're like more serious ones, but you know, I enjoyed this one. Um, and then lastly, there's like this area of work that touches engineering, which would be like um, entrepreneurship. And Zen founder is one where the author, she's like a clinical psychologist, and she talks about how the stress of building a company, working with team, uh, and so on, and how to deal with it. And interviews entrepreneurs, some of them are technical, some are not. So uh, I found her podcast also very useful. And once again, like, you know, these people have been doing this for many years. Go through the archive, pick an episode or two that you enjoy, uh, that looks interesting, and if not, just skip. Let's go to the next one. And that's it. So podcasts are useful. I encourage you to listen to them more. Thank you. Woo! OK. Um, hello, I'm Manuel from Argentina. And I, 10 years ago, I attended the best event of Python ever in my life. That is called PyCamp. And it was, I only know that it's, uh, it's doing in Argentina. But um, I moved to Spain like four years ago. And I wanted to share this experience with other people because to me it was the best event in the world. So my girlfriend and myself are organizing this event in Spain. It's called Pi Camp Spain. And this is, we, we rent a bus to go to the place in, in the nature, right? The idea is to uh, just put 30 people in a bus, go to a place, go for um, four days, all inclusive, in the middle of the mountains, in the nature, you know, without a structure, without talks, without workshop, without anything. Just whatever you want to do um, while in the nature, without worrying about cooking, without worrying about food, without worrying about um, sleeping or anything. You just buy everything on in, up front. It's, it was super cheap because um, we we didn't expect like very uh, comfortable things, right? So. Uh, was super accessible, um, and I I want to I want more people in other countries to organize these kind of events. That is why I'm here. I'm trying to encourage you to just to meet with people, and instead of 
uh, listen, as you are listening to me today, just do things with other people and make friends, right? We have um, different, we had like kind of a schedule. There was a schedule in the same time where we were talking, right? There is no compromises, there is nothing. Just go there, spend time with friends or with unknown people that after four days, they become your friends. So it's a really good way to be distracted, but do not spend like four days in front of a computer. So more like, um, I don't know, building more rela human relationship uh, through the code, I would say. So, and we have this particular event that is called um, karaoke talks, right? Where you should, some random person in the audience download uh, a slave and another person without knowing about the talk just start talking, the other person just go flipping the slide and you have to invent everything uh, live basically. And it's super fun, it's super, super fun. So I really, really recommend it. And actually this is, uh, I don't know the name in English, but uh, signs, uh, language with the, with the hands. So there was a person uh, like inventing the content of the talk and there was like a translator that was inventing what the other person was saying as, as well. So it was, it was super interesting. This was kind of the venue. Um, this was where we, um, we slipped. We have a very strict code of conduct, right? And we try to, of course, because we are going to share four days all together and sleep at night all together, uh, we are super strict with that thing. So um, we had zero incidents and it was amazing. All these people were super happy with this kind of event. And I will, I would love to see, I would love to help people here in Porto and also in other cities if they are interested in organizing this event. So that is basically everything I want to share with you. There are a bunch of pictures here and that's it. Thank you. Thank you, man. Okay, so I'm going to be talking to you about some Python productivity power-ups. My goal from the next five minutes is to increase the productivity of everyone in the room by at least 1% over the next five minutes. So, uh, hello, my name is John Sandal. I am the CEO of Principal Data Scientist at Coefficient. We're a full-stack data science consultancy in London. I run PyData London, the conference, and the meetup. Come and talk to me if you want to speak. I also have an online course. We just hit 12,000 attendees. I'm super excited about that, but I'm even more excited about the next four and a half minutes. So first of all, uh, if anyone is using all eight of these, I will buy you a drink, uh, although one of them is my own package, so that's a bit stacked against you. So TQDM, my first tip. What is it? Well, if you like running for loops, but you don't like waiting to see how long they're going to take, it's a progress bar. Now, what I really want to show you is some of the ways that you could use this in your day-to-day -day work. For example, with pandas, you can actually run. Uh, here's just a, a data frame with a million rows in it that I'm getting ready to go. You might do dot apply, get bored waiting. I'm going to get bored waiting with that. So what I'm going to do is instead load tqdm.pandas and then run the progress apply. But I'm going to get bored waiting even for that because my favorite package of the last 12 months is pandarallel, really hard to say. Pandarallel.initialize and then suddenly we've got 10 cores multiprocessing that apply call. Super cool. So next up, uh, joblib. Let's imagine we've got a simple function. This is just going to sleep for three seconds and then return the input times 10. Takes three seconds, kind of slow. Now, if, like me, you're a mathematician, you didn't learn about memoization until really late into your career, this is an amazing thing to know about for data scientists. So from joblib, import memory. Uh, we just do a little bit of configuration, decorate my function with memory.cache. Now, the first time it sees it, it's going to calculate that through. It's going to take three seconds, super slow. But it's going to remember the input, store the output, and then return that back to you immediately. So again, here's another example. Going to time that 42. Remembers the input, remembers the output, gives it to you in milliseconds rather than three seconds. OK, so TQDM, Pandarallel, Joblib. Let's move on. Also clear the memory for the next time we give this talk. So linting. If you are working with other people, agreeing on your style guide is a really nice thing. Uh, who here uses black? Hands up. Yeah, lots of people. If you haven't come across Black, really nice code auto formatter. But do you use Black in your Jupyter notebooks? Jupyter Black, very easy, one line and an install, and suddenly it's going to start formatting your notebooks for you. This is gorgeous, so much better. So share that with your team. Similar to that, iSort. Uh, many of you may be using iSort to sort your imports, import sort. Uh, one of the PyQA uh, Py, uh, uh, 
uh, projects now. Now, it can be used as a command line tool. It can also be used uh, as a VS Code uh, plugin if you configure everything nicely in your, say, PyProject.toml iSort config files. So really nice tool, but I like using it in my pre-commits. So let's uh, make this nice and big for you, and I'm just going to load up my pre-commit. And it's going to clean that file up for me, run loads of auto flake, uh, black iSort for me. And if we take another look at that file now, it's, uh, it's going to be cleaned up for me nice and. So one of the things that I've actually just used there is this really nice tool. This is one of my other benefits, is Control R, which is FZF if you've installed FZF. Otherwise, it's just bog standard uh, reverse search. What is FZF? It's a fuzzy finder for your entire command line history. It's like Google search for your personal command line history. So, control R, and I can do pre, I'm gonna get that pre command. I can't be bothered to type that every single day, or something like, say, the poetry sync. It's too much, so FZF in a few characters, and off you go. So if you're thinking that sounds like a lot of configuration, pre-commit, FZF, what are we talked about? Black, iSort, Joblib, TQDM. One thing I can recommend to you is all of these and many more in uh, our coefficient cookie cutter. Uh, blends my favorite cookie cutters, cookie cutter data science, cookie cutter hypermodern Python, gov cookie cutter for some amazing government UK security benefits, all in one package. If you are uh, really bored of actually working with a project where you have to onboard people, uh, there's documentation, a quick start and a getting started guide for people that don't even know what PyEnv and poetry are. Uh, if you want CI, it's just there, ready to go, baked in for GitHub, for GitLab. So loads of really nice features. Do check it out. Um, if you would like to talk to me about uh, any of these tools, if you'd like to come and speak at PyData London Meetup, or if you'd like to work with us at Coefficient, uh, then uh, do come and speak to me afterwards. Uh, also, this is all available on GitHub, Python Productivity Power Ups. If that's too hard to remember, just look me up on Twitter. I've just live tweeted a full list of everything I've just mentioned. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ready. Let's go. All right, everyone. So you will have heard about PyScript, AKA Python in the browser. Well, enter Django in the browser. <laughs> Created today, it's called Absurd Django, and we have all of Django running completely on the client here, including storage. So let me show you quickly how it works. I'm gonna refresh this page so you know it's not fake. We start off with everything commented out. I'm gonna uh, uncomment this. It's a bit bare bones, so actually we go to index to add a random to-do, and I'm gonna refresh that a few times. Then we can go to to-dos. You see it's really live, so this is all 404, 404, 404. Um, and in to-dos, we have our list of to-dos. I can refresh this as much as I want, and uncomment this again, and we have all of our to-dos back. Um, so this is real, this is SQLite stored inside of IndexedDB and all of Django running in the browser, which is a bit absurd. We can also clear our, um, all of our to-dos, you know, and then we have nothing left in to-dos again, and go back to index and add some more. Uh, my favorite thing so far in all of this, and you can see some of the code that makes all of this happen, um, we have a template, of course, so this is a real Django template running live in the browser, so we can do fun things like add marquee, of course, uh, we can also add a style tag um, and just do something like background color red to improve readability. Um, uh, my favorite thing though in this whole thing I have to say so far is the experience with exceptions because as soon as I start typing, oh, there's also two space indent, we gotta fix that. Uh, you can just see everything live, right? So there's no saving your file and reloading your page it's all live in the browser. So this is probably the fastest debugging experience you've ever seen. <laughs> like, what more could you want, right? Um, I think in terms of the next steps for this project, Absurd Django, uh, we'll look at implementing WebRTC. With WebRTC, it means that other users will be able to connect to your Django server, which is running in your client, um, and then you can serve this, this page to everyone else and they can use the database that's running in your browser, in the client. And uh, then as long as your laptop is running, uh, the site will be up. As soon as it goes down, um, uh, it's all right, it's gone. You know, you, you, they don't need to always use it, it's fine. Uh, so yeah, this is Absurd Django. All of this project was created today, mostly by Patrick. Patrick, raise your hand. Woo! <laughs> And 
And as you might be able to, to see, you can go to it right now. It's live. It's deployed at appsert-django.vercel.app. Uh, if you want to learn more about this, uh, come talk to us, I suppose. <laughs> uh, we'll, be at, uh, we'll be around and uh, happy to take any contributions. Uh, if you know about WebRTC also, we'd love to talk to you. Um, thank you. <laughs>